Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. The following is a discussion recorded on Sunday, August 13th, 2023 at the 4th and Other Carolina Anarchist Book Fair in so-called Asheville, North Carolina. More recordings can be found at acabookfair.noblogs.org. The Mediterranean Sea is Europe's deadliest border. For years, non-state actors like Sea Watch and other NGOs have played a part in humanitarian search and rescue operations. In spite of legal repression and the technical challenges of maintaining a civil fleet, Anarchists, anti-fascists, and other activists try to stop needless death at sea. The following is a report back from a wayward American yacht punk who spent the summer doing rotations on two different SAR ships. They'll discuss the general political situation, the reality of everyday operations, and how you can get involved. A quick announcement before we start the show. The only publicly identified jailhouse lawyer speak activist, Sundiata Jawanza, is concerned that his outgoing mail is being tampered with. If you've been in contact with Sundiata and haven't heard back, please reach out to freejawanza at protonmail.com and let them know. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Sorry, I just got a car back. There you go. Uh, yeah, I have thrown this presentation together kind of last minute. Uh, I try to avoid the pitfall of my least favorite types of comrade presentations where I just get up here and tell everyone stuff they already know. And, like, I think if you're here, you probably kind of already know in general what, like, Sea Watch and Search and Rescue and stuff in the Mediterranean does. In the most general sense, you're maybe more here for, like, what's the scene like now, what's happening, that kind of thing. So I try to avoid that, but in the beginning, I'm going to kind of, like, go through like a general like what things like look like in person my experiences and then from there kind of like a uh i don't know compare other like anti-border struggle and migrant solidarity and stuff like that so all right so welcome to my report back uh so so what the heck is this And I'll be throwing a lot of terms, search and rescue, NGOs, the civil fleet. Uh, NGO sounds wrong to our American ears. Like we hear that, we think World Bank, IMF, that stuff. But like, it's almost more directly translates to like kind of like nonprofit in like the way that like lots of these different ships that do migrant solidarity at sea are organized under. And it's confusing because like there's all these like different ships and then each one has its own NGO and they're all like named different. So kind of trying to like introduce you to this general thing. But first off, like what, what uh, ships in the Mediterranean, both central and eastern Mediterranean, try to provide as like kind of a short list of things. One is just like basic, like the overall game that everyone that does kind of like migrant solidarity is pretty much just like trying to prevent needless death, trying to save lives. And I see that means like preventing drownings, hypothermia, um, people often describe the Mediterranean as the, the world's deadliest border and like it's not like a misery Olympics but um, uh, like a lot of people drown in the Mediterranean especially the central Mediterranean um, there's a huge am- amount of like loss of life um, it's a tragedy and just like, kind of for some general historical context uh, until 2014 15 there was an Italian-led, like, government organization, Mare Nordstrom, that uh, was responsible for rescuing people at sea, migrants included, and for through political reasons, this service was pulled back, and there was a, a massive amount of deaths that started occurring uh, because no one would respond to distress cases at sea, and so this is when organizations like Sea Watch and other NGOs uh, began to kind of like get in the game and. Uh, just try to be present in the Mediterranean and save people's lives. Uh, Other things, you know, like medical aid, people have like all sorts of like crazy uh, trauma that's like uh, untreated and injuries. Uh, Just kind of being there. um, 
often, you know, the whole ocean is full of, like, different authorities. And NGOs are, like, only this, like, one, like, player in this, like, weird, like, swirling mix of, like, cops and sort of cops and, like, paramilitary organizations. And so this sort of, like, cop watch style, um, like, like being there in what is otherwise a completely, like, invisible part of the world, like, who knows what's going on at sea, uh, is, like, really important and is almost kind of, like, a... More in keeping with like the origins of like Sea Watch and stuff, as was described to me, uh, uh, like the reason like the Sea Watch logo is like originally like a pair of binoculars is because they're like we just need to get out there and like document this, and then very quickly it's like holy shit, this is out of control and people are dying everywhere, which goes into like reporting, showing Europe what this looks like, and then maybe the thing that these kind of orgs are most known for is using this infrastructure, the civil fleet boats to like bring people safely to Europe. And this is kind of like what they're most like famed and like notorious among the right for as they're kind of like seen part of like, uh, this like wider network of illegal entry into the European union. Um, that kind of thing. So depending on your politics, like what they're heralded for, you know, I mean, obviously we're all, we're all us. So. <laughs> Uh, all right, and a general kind of like, where was I? Uh, sorry for this like hack of a thing. Check this out. <laughs> <laughs> so you might think it's this like big vast open ocean, and your like kind of like idea of what search and rescue at sea looks like is just like a uh, a ship just kind of wandering the NPC, like looking for someone out there. But it's like just the opposite. It's just like this mashup of different borders and demarcations and lines and areas and constant observation and it's actually there's like way more out there than you appreciate and these uh, borders and territories are actually very significant uh, there are territorial waters of uh, different countries um, but what's maybe more relevant here are these search and rescue zones that uh, that European powers have agreed to like kind of divvy up just as like a uh, sort of like a uh, like responsibility for um, responding to uh, distress cases at sea. Uh, so these are not like territorial waters, but it's more like a sort of like semi-voluntary, like, oh, we'll take care of like humanitarian crisis in these areas. Um, and if I point out anything on this map that will be relevant from my experiences, like what a f***ed up looking shape the Maltese search and rescue area is. So <laughs> this is Lampedusa. This is an Italian island. This is Lampedusa is kind of the equivalent of uh, uh, like Lesbos for the Central Mediterranean. It's like the island everyone's trying to make it to. It's the first European town. It's the shortest distance from Tunisia. It is it, it's it's part of Europe, but this like multi star kind of does this weird like swing around uh, Lampedusa between Tunisia and Lampedusa, and we'll talk in like many of the ways that. Europe tries to like subtly create like border enforcement where they otherwise can't is um, for one reason or another Malta politically has this policy of like does not answer the phone to distress cases. Malta is like go die, go drown, no one will ever respond to you. And Italy kind of tries to play good cop and it's like we have the resources, we have this uh, coast guard that is out here to rescue people. Oh, but if you're the Maltese Tsar, then you just call Malta and they'll allegedly help you out, and they won't. So this is kind of the first, like, layer of, of border enforcement in the Mediterranean. Hey, Kyle, what on there is water and what is land? Um, okay, so this is the coast of North Africa. Um, and, uh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> I know this doesn't exactly, like, match up. Um, and, uh, oh, it, it, it shows up much better on my screen. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is all washed out. Uh, this is Sicily. And the, the blue lines are actually the territorial waters of these different countries. Uh, I, th that actually shows up really bad. Sorry. It looks way better on my computer. Okay. <laughs> so, the, so, like, it looks like Lampedusa's same color as stuff. See, Lampedusa is like a speck. It is like a, a duct. Like, so the stuff in the space in the middle is the water. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and this is about 110-ish miles from... This city, Sfax, in, uh, on the east coast of Tunisia, which is uh, the major point of departure for this new wave of the corridor of immigration leaving North Africa to Europe. 
Um, 110 miles, it's like something you can do in a small boat in like a day and a half if the weather's right and if nothing goes wrong and if everything else lines up. Um, but this is a new corridor. Historically, for most of like the NGO search and rescue scene, um, these routes from Libya uh, are were like much more common. Like Libya is still kind of associated with like uh, where like migrants are coming from in the search and rescue scene, and uh, Libya is also like a much worse place to be in present day if you're like trying to leave North Africa. Um, there's these routes, the banana routes, where people uh, try to avoid Libyan authorities that are uh, kind of in cahoots with Frontex, the European border enforcement agencies, to, to do pullbacks, to kidnap people, to like capture people and take them back to Libya. So that it's like weird routes that don't make any sense of like kind of skirt the line between Tunisian and Libyan uh, territorial waters and search and rescue zones to, to avoid Libyan paramilitaries, pretty much, the, the Libyan Coast Guard that I'll introduce later, and, uh, and kind of merge into the same corridor that people use coming from Tunisia. And, and it doesn't, and these aren't always just like the closest distances. Like, uh, some people obviously will leave from Benghazi, which is like far eastern Libya, and it's right, that doesn't make any sense, like, logistically, but people will be skirting the Libyan coast for days, and this is where you get like really like hard up cases that are like. Uh, have endured incredible hardship, uh, out of food, out of water, out of fuel, have made this like torturously long route to avoid authorities to make it to Europe. Why don't people go to Crete? Uh, so close on your map. You know, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's like this is actually a much larger distance than like this, uh -huh. and uh, there. Are, I, I don't know. I mean, this, you're like, and this is like a good uh, time to say that, like, I am not, I'm like just some like random American that just like kind of showed up in Europe and was like, did two rotations. And so I know like a very like limited like window of like what, of all like everything that happens in the Mediterranean, especially like the Eastern Mediterranean, like I have no clue what's going on. Um, but uh, if it is a migrant corridor, I, I don't know about it. it. It seems to me like a lot more open ocean, a lot more like, hard to interact with like authorities and in the same sense that like with y'all that are familiar with like no more dust that like it's this like really um uh uh kind of counterintuitive first that like lots of people are like looking to like find some sort of authority to like turn themselves into to get refugee status like which isn't exactly intuitive the same thing is true here like a lot of these people are trying to make it to Italian Coast Guard in the Italian search and rescue zone so that they can then have a chance of getting some kind of refugee status. So it's not, this is not like entirely like, uh, uh, this is very like, it's not people like trying to like clandestinely arrive on European shores under the cover of night for fear of like being pushed back. In fact, it's just the opposite. Like if you make it into the Italian search and rescue zone and you don't drown and you, someone responds to you in time, you will make it to Europe. Like, 100%. Like, everyone gets there if you can make it that far, which makes it like this weird game of like, no, you can't just get on a ferry from the country you're leaving, but if you risk death and you go out to sea and then chance encounter some authority, you will arrive in Europe and get steered into, like, the machine, which is like the migrant processing, like, everything system. So, uh, next thing, we got an ethics alert. So I was with these two different works. The first ship I was on, everyone's kind of like punks and anarchists and, and like they had kind of the same like prohibition on photography that most people like, every once we take a distant backlit photograph, but, but you know, kind of the like no photographs of anything culture, which, which I'm not really for or against. I think in a lot of ways, I'm like, damn, I wish we had like photos of this thing because it was cool. But just to say like, we didn't take much like, photos of like the first photo but the second one for like reasons I'll explain that uh was kind of like a more like straight laced like humanitarian uh the uh, NGO but you know survives off of like donations and it's social media presence and those people like were really into taking photos like lots <laughs> a lot of photos um and there was like a like half-hearted attempt to everyone to be like you will mind if we take pictures but, like, I cannot make any claim that everyone is like, do we have your consent to use, to take pictures of you? Like, absolutely not. Uh, I, but, um, 
I have included a lot of photos, and they're they're going to look like you know like mostly Germans, not all but like entirely mostly like white people like uh, interacting with like migrants at sea who are mostly like black Africans and like uh, like Arabic speaking people, and like it's going to look like that. I I kind of curated it to try to choose photos that that preserve some sense of like uh, individuality among people in this like I, I don't know I can't really describe like my thought process here but uh, I I went ahead and I was thinking like oh maybe I should do this whole thing where I do the punk high contrast and wash out everyone's faces and but mostly out of laziness I didn't do that so I have like lots of like photographs of like people in like tough situations uh, yeah um, so just talking about like boats and like what migrant boats look like the classic one are these rubber boats that were really synonymous with uh, departures from Tunisia it, these are like the best and the worst they're like very stable when they're together but they can fail catastrophically uh, the story goes you used to be able to like buy these on like uh, like Alibaba's like refugee boat and it was kind of this weird smuggling of these things into Libya to be used as like migrant boats um but nowadays they're kind of like, oh, like it's like the best of the worst. And there's a lot that I won't cover. There's sometimes you see like random fiberglass boats that could be like really big, really small, often coming from Libya. But the ones that are really characteristic about my experience in particular and Tunisia in particular and this explosion of migration from Tunisia are these things that people call, uh, here's another fiberglass boat. And they can, this is just an example of how like, there's, there's very, there's lots of like, divide just among migrants of like some people like have, have kind of a nice boat and some people are like oh my god y'all are all about to die this is crazy um but the ones that are most associated with tunisia like i say are these things called iron boats that it's like a new trend of like starting about a year ago of of what i imagine are some just garages in tunisia just kind of cranking out these boats made of like really thin plate steel really crudely welded bonded, like, sealed with, like, kind of some Bondo-type compound that uh, have no internal, like, in, like buoyancy, no, like, uh, like flotation chambers, like, none of the typical safety of boats that are then, like, dangerously overloaded with just, like, freeboard is, like, the, the distance between the, the surface of the water and, like, the rails of a boat and are, are, like, inches off the water that, like, will float in, like, calm conditions, but, could, uh, like, uh, are, are dangerous. They can like sink like really easily. They're, since it's a rigid boat, it's like it's really easy to tip them. Um, they're like really frightening, and uh, they're kind of hard, hard to deal with also because they're like jagged and like notorious for like popping like inflatable like life saving rafts and tubes and and boats. Uh, but they're kind of just these cheap disposable things being like churned out by the like the human smuggling industry inside of Sfax. Uh, and like every time I'd see one, I'd be like, oh, thank God. This one for, only has like 25 people on it, but I'd always be wrong. There's always be like at least 40 or more. And it seemed like every single one we come across would have more people in it of like, like a lots of like really young people, but like sometimes like families and like babies and like, it's just like crazy how overcrowded they were like amazingly overcrowded. Uh, and the other, other people that I'm going to be talking about is this is a the Italian coast guard. Uh, Charlie Papa for short um, that are uh, I call those like firefighter vibes or you know some people will be like oh no firefighters aren't cops they're like they're like you know like honest like uh, uh, workers or something and it's like part of our but it's like you meet them and like I don't know they're kind of they seem like cops to me <laughs> that kind of dynamic like that was my impression of Charlie Papa they're like allegedly not out there to like uh, to uh, work in like uh they're not trying to, like, throw people in prison. Uh, that's, like, Frontex. They're not trying to, like, identify, like, who are the smugglers here, which usually just means, like, who is the unfortunate teenager who has their hand on the tiller. Um, they're allegedly just a life-saving service. And historically, they've even kind of stood up against, like, right-wing populism in Italy when uh, different governments tried to, like, close the, the migrant corridor. They kind of, like, stood solidarity is like a strong term to use but like this is our job and we have a boat full of migrants and what do you mean we can't re-enter the support and like kind of made a political stand which is like interesting uh, but I have personally seen them like kick migrants in the face who are like trying to board just like out of order or, or something you know so like 
it's a very like strange relationship we have with them. Sometimes we were like desperately need them to like bring people to Lampedusa safely. And there's like no way we can deal with like the and huge numbers without them. Uh, but you know, this love hate relationship, um, Guardia Financia, I won't talk too much. They're more kind of like cops. Uh, and then there's Frontex that are like just cops. Then Frontex is notable in that they're not like Italian authorities. They're like this weird nebulous, like European organization. And they are the ones out to like, just like arbitrarily throw out charges of human smuggling, not against like who are obviously the human smugglers, but like, again, like it's really common. Like you'll have a boat of like Arab nationals and like, and then there's like one like black dude who is like had to pay less, but the de- deal is like he steers the whole time. But the risk is like, if you're just photograph steering, then you can be like thrown in jail for human smuggling. It's like absurd. In the EU though? Thrown in jail in the EU? Yes. Yes. Um, and so that's the kind of thing Frontex does. They're like, they like have all these, like they actually have, it's one of those weird things where it's like, damn, this whole thing is actually like under the watchful eye of this weird, the uh, giant government organization. And like, uh, it's more just about like this whole situation is about just like sharing information and like being able to communicate and like, these kinds of questions. So yeah, front text. They're just cops. Mm-hmm. Um, so my personal experience, <laughs> I described with like three key points to make. When I was there, um, there were these like really new Italian laws targeting NGO ships. Um, and so this is kind of like in the film, like what's going on nowadays, where um, historically boats have gotten bigger and bigger and all these NGO boats out there. That's like, <laughs> imagine if like some, some like donor bought no more deaths, like an entire like army field hospital and like all of its modern trappings. These like multi million dollar ships for the explicit purpose of like rescuing migrants. The 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 pockets of like German liberals are like endless, and there's like <laughs> these huge ships out there, and there is like right wing Italian reactionary politics. That they, that they can't outright ban search and rescue. I, I didn't touch on this, I think, uh, at the beginning, but the whole premise, unless I did and I already forget, but the idea is international maritime law stipulates, like, if you're at sea and there is a distress case, you not only can, but you're obligated to respond to a, a distress case at sea. And it's that line of all NGOs that, like, all of these, like, overloaded, inherently dangerous, unseaworthy boats are distress cases. And so, like... This is kind of like, I don't know if you want to call it a loophole or just common sense that uh, we have the ability to like respond to all of these and like bring them to like a safe port. Um, but these new, so they can't outright ban it, but they found these like workarounds like, yeah, you can do a rescue, but then you immediately have to sail to this port that someone in Rome assigned you. And it's a political assignment. And they send these huge ships like, hundreds of miles away um, to ports in, like, northern Italy, which that doesn't... You know, boats take a long time to get anywhere. And uh, the amount of fuel and resources and time that this, like, absorbs from NG boats is a way that it's just, like, uh, right-wing politics in Italy are trying to, like, bleed these organizations dry. Like, if you're inside one of the fuel bunkers of some of these, like, larger NGOs, it's like being in, like, a three-car garage. It's like... <laughs> you know, it's like, that's a whole other thing to talk about of like how much like diesel is just like being burned and all this. But for practical purposes, it's just like, it's a really quick way to like, to, to drain the resources of NGOs and like get them out of the game and like slow down this process. Um, so these laws are brand new and it was kind of in this like really fraught situation where like, damn, all we can do really is find people at sea and like stabilize them which is kind of just like give them life jackets, give them water, give them something to eat and like hound authorities on our communications, on the radio, on uh, like satellite communications to like, you absolutely have to respond to this boat. If you don't respond, they will drown. And then like one after another and just kind of being almost like, like a nuisance to like authorities that like begrudgingly eventually like agree. Like usually uh, no one's ever actually in the Italian SAR yet, but if you're like on the radio and they're close enough that eventually Charlie Papa will be like, 
okay, like we'll send some out eventually. And but it really sucks because like a lot of like the heyday of like Sea Watch, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, is being able to just like scoop up like hundreds of people at a time and like bring them to somewhere safe so they won't drown. And uh, they like really have been able to put uh, um, like a speed bump in this. So that all of a sudden these like huge ships that the NGO world has like geared up to like, yeah, we have bigger and cooler ships like aren't really as effective anymore. Cause it's like, once you do one rescue, they're signed somewhere like super far away. And like, you might as well just be a small boat. And I, uh, just because it's kind of what I'm into is like sort of like a little like scrappy yacht punk sailor guy. I'm kind of like into small boats anyway. And so my experience, it's kind of like their time to shine and like, well, if you can only like take on so many people at a time anyway, uh, why not just have lots of small boats? Um, but these laws are new, so the whole political situation was adapting to like these, like a new form of like state repression. The other major factor is like, like I said, this enormous spike coming from Tunisia. And as like a general explainer, I'm like not at all an expert in Tunisian politics, but um, there's been like a huge surge in right wing ultranationalism, specifically targeting like black. Western Central Africans, many of whom have been like living in Tunisia for a long time because it's like relatively prosperous. But uh, this this right wing narrative of like black people are like robbing Tunisia of its identity or something, and just like you know, I all of you see where this is going. Uh, there, there's like outpourings of like violence against black people in Tunisia. Um, there's like most horrifically government efforts to like resettle black people in camps in the desert to like get them out of Tunisian cities so uh, all these people that have like built new lives in Tunisia all of a sudden like oh shit, we have to get the f- out of Tunisia so probably like lots of people already had lives in Tunisia and then and then a lot of people also Tunisia is like like a, a corridor so it's like kind of half and half of like are people just moving through Tunisia trying to get to Europe from countries like Cameroon, Mali, uh, Benin, uh, Ghana or are they, like, have they been there for years? And so, uh, for both of these reasons, there was like a sudden increasing spike in, in immigration from Tunisia. And I really felt like I just like saw in my very short time there, like the exponential growth, even in like my very short, like month and a half I was doing this. And then the third, it was hot as f- I know it's like hot right now. And, and everyone, if you ever say like, it was an unprecedented heat wave, it's like next week, it's like the precedent is broken again. It was very hot. It was like very hard. I can't emphasize enough how much like how hot and like this inescapable high pressure just really like colored my entire experience uh, and was you know like dangerous for people being out at sea with no water with, like their kids and shit, with, like no water for who knows how long. Uh, it just made conditions brutal for everyone. Uh, and here's like uh, my friend Jonas just like glistening with sweat again you can't really see this like after the sun is like already going down there's just like no escape from it and uh our old like Cesare our like Italian like old timer was just like totally like it was hard it was hard a hard time um so the two boats I was on I'm almost kind of like trying to wrap up the one um Margo is a new iteration of the oldest sea watch boat like the first sea watch ship which is itself like a extremely ancient, like over a hundred year old, like fishing trawler. Um, that uh, it's kind of like when you have this like old house that's had like new extensions built onto it, like 18 times in a row. And this was kind of like the more sort of like, uh, like a uh, confrontational um, small NGO that I like found my way onto um, through like a recommendation of a friend. Um, it's like kind of new to the scene and its whole stick is just like to, just to get out there as fast as possible and like start handing out life jackets. Um, and it kind of like had like a political nature right, right before my rotation on it. Um, Marigo had tried to directly defy these new Italian laws by taking a bunch of people on board and being like, no, we can't go to trap honey. That's like way too far. We are going into Lampedusa whether you like it or not. And it's like this huge scene. Um, and 
Uh, of course, then, you know, they got, like, the repercussions from that. They uh, were impounded. They had to pay this huge fine, which is kind of just, like, what all the laws are about. If you break any of these laws, it's like, fine, well, you're just, like, locked down. You're in board boat jail. Uh, so we got this cool, like, ESL banner that doesn't read right, but, like, you know, it was like, uh, some of the people were, like, just off of a Sea Watch boat that was also impounded, and this is, like, this one was getting unimpounded, so like, oh, let's all team up on this one boat to, like, get back on there. Yeah, Margo. Margo's cool. Uh, this is a picture of Nier, but then I didn't discuss about, like, how, so how do we, like, find people out there? And, uh, you know, for, like, I keep trying to, like, oh, how can I, like tie this into experiences with, like, people that have done No More Deaths and stuff. Uh, so, like, there, there is just kind of, like, aimless wandering that happens. Like, a little bit of that. Like, kind of, like, what you imagine of just, like, being out at sea up on the monkey deck with a pair of binoculars, like, looking for someone. And, like, we did indeed sometimes find boats, like, just, like, god damn, there's, like, there's people on the boat out there. It's hard to tell sometimes because there's a lot of empty boats. Like, a lot. Like, the whole sea is filled with them. It's, like, it's an obstacle. But sometimes we would just find people with binoculars. But more commonly, there's, like, networks called Alarm Phone that works with people, like, on both sides of the border to provide them with, like, communications equipment to at least be able to send a message of, like, yo, this group of people is trying to make this crossing and about this place at about this time, uh, like, be aware, like, they might need help. Sometimes they do have sat phones, so if they are, like, oh, shit, we are sinking, they have some way of, like, relaying their communication to, like, operators who, like, live in Europe that then, like, convey relevant information to uh, whoever is at sea at the time. And when I was on Marigo, we were the only NGO boat in this whole area of, like, the Tunisian road. And for reasons that are hard to describe, it's, like, a newer thing, and there's kind of this inertia in the greater, like, civil fleet world to be, like, Libya is still, like, the real migrant corridor or something. It's, like, where we're needed because it's, like bigger stretches of ocean and whatever. So, like, a lot of the big boats, like, hang out in there. And, like, oh, you little boats can, like, handle the Tunisian corridor. Uh, which, I, I, in hindsight, is obviously a great mistake, but sometimes it's hard to overcome that inertia. So, yeah, we were, like, the only NGO boat out there. Um, so we were getting kind of, like, flooded with alarm phone calls all the time, many more than we could respond to. Uh, Mark is slow. It's, like, it, it cruises at, like, six knots, which is just kind of, like, like a you know a little bit faster than the jog, <laughs> you know, trying to like cover the world like the ocean like this, um, and then uh, strangely, uh, it was almost shocking for me to know a few different NGOs have like aircraft assets. Uh, sea Watch has like an uh, aircraft organization. Uh, um, God, what's it called? Uh, uh, whatever. <laughs> it's like the Sea Watch Seabird, whatever. Um, and there are other NGOs, Pila Volontaire is a French one, that, like, uh, are, like, flying search patterns with, like, friendly aircraft with, like, crews of, like, spotters and stuff. And they are constantly relaying uh, positions if they find uh, people in distress at sea to us. And it's, like, overwhelmingly useful, instantly transports you from, like, the 19th century at least to, like, the 20th century, <laughs> you know, in terms of, like, what, how effective you can actually be. Um, but they're very limited in their hours and their resources and their like flight time. Uh, and then the last method is uh, is just radio uh, distress calls, which I'll explain more. But almost always comes from like Tunisian fishermen, which are like the like uh, most common like like human traffickers, smugglers in, in the game. Um, but I mean that's like a good thing for them to be doing to be like radioing positions, so uh, at least we can respond to them. Uh, so that's kind of like where our information comes from. So this is like, okay, this, this crashed my computer every time I tried to do it. We'll see if this works. Uh, so conceptually, I mean, this is like a totally like artistic representation of kind of what uh, our route looked like. This tiny little red thing is Lampedusa. On Margo, we were at sea like the entire time. And we just like kind of bopped around to different distress cases. And eventually um, doing this thing where we just like hang out with people until Coast Guard shows up and then move to the next one and hang out with them and make sure that like no one's drowning until we, there was this case like way down in the Libyan Tsar that's like damn like nobody is coming for them and so we were like let's leave kind of this is like the cluster right this is like where that Maltesar makes the weird little triangular hook shape and uh, went to pick up this boat coming from Libya that was like turned out to be full of like a uh, 
Tigrayan refugees, which is like a crazy thing to like sink home to me. It's like, oh wow, this like war that I've always heard about is like real. It's like teenagers from Tigray that were just like the tension was broken and they were just kind of adrift at sea for a few days. Uh and so yeah, we'd find boats. Always, everything always happens at night. Like no matter how well you plan, like you're always getting somewhere at night. You're always showing back up to Lampedusa at night. It's just like kind of the Murphy's Law of doing things at sea. It's like everything would happen at night. Um, it's like super hard to spot these like really low lying boats. Usually it's people like signaling with cell phones. Um, uh, and that's just kind of like going off of like positions, coordinates that are like always like a little bit old and we have to be like guessing where we might find someone. Uh, but this is a, uh, yeah. So this is my time in Margo until we picked up like the, the grand dudes and we got assigned a port of safety in Trepani, which is like Northwest Sicily, which doesn't sound very far away, but for a boat that does six knots, it's like very far away, especially like from like Lampedusa. That would have been like a, a 30 mile trip. This is us like pulling into Trepani at night with uh, what we thought was a crowded boat. And I would sense like really come to reconsider my, uh, perceptions of what a crowded boat is with like 40 50 people on board and it's like it's rough you're kind of just like after all this work you've done and trying to make like connections with people we're kind of just like bringing them into a kettle you know we're bringing them to like a ferry dock where there's like police like lights rolling over the entire dock there's like all these transport vans waiting for them um and they're kind of like immediately steered into this like uh you know the like migrant like uh, uh, like not detention detention camps sort of um, so yeah that was my time on Mar Go and the other boat I was on was the sailboat called Nadir which was a slightly smaller boat I kind of got drawn to it because it's like a sailboat and I'm like a sailor and I'm like, that sounds cool um, but kinda, this is like the more like straight laced NGO that has this like uh Kind of like board of directors it feels like larger than the boat like uh uh <laughs> the joke i keep making is like i don't know if y'all, y'all are like jeff vandermeer fans or the, the area x like trilogy but it really felt like there was kind of this like like weird invisible like like a structure southern reach style that was like assembling these crews to like send them out one on one and be like we don't really have connections to the engine you know? and they're like we've like assembled you know an engineer and a rip driver and, like, <laughs> and someone with language skills and like um, but it was like kind of cool in a way that it, it wasn't like a, I should talk about this like more. I can talk about this later. Um, and it kind of represents this like other tack that the search and rescue world has taken that's like different than the big sea watch ships. That's like we're not trying to become like professionals. We're not trying to like compete with uh, the like state life saving services and the Coast Guard. We're trying to like force their hand. Like we, we're not trying to become this thing that like they just rely on to do their job for them, for better or worse. I mean, there's political arguments to be made either way. But this is kind of like in that pedigree. And uh, so the NGO is rescue ship. And yeah, it's kind of I like hesitate to just say like all oh, their liberals or whatever because I mean they are like if you're doing this like, you like you know there, there's some like inherent understanding that like borders are violence and like the world is f-ed. and like. I don't want to, like, you know, like, disparage, like, any of these people, like, involved, because, like, they are, they're all cool, but, like, not, like, subcultural anarchists and, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's Nadir under sale. Um, it was, like, very, like, German in this way that, like, this boat is all about efficiency and how efficiently we can, like, stay out at sea and go from one case to the next and burn as little fuel as possible and do this with kind of, like, a small boat and, like, when you play it by the numbers against these giant, like, mega tug things that look like almost like battleships that other NGOs use, it is, like, surprisingly, like, damn, you only burned, like, 200 gallons of diesel? It's, like, insane. Um, and uh, uh, I was a, a rib driver. I'm kind of like the little dude in the little boat. That is kind of the way that we interact with uh, things that we come across. Um people and like small boats that we come across and there's kind of like other like general positions you know you have someone like in communication with like authorities and everyone else and you know, there's like someone that's like a doctor or nurse or some kind of medic and uh yeah you know, it's a boat and kind of like boat 
kind of people. Um, and uh, so maybe I kind of like went through this, but to reiterate, like what we do, this is like the Nadir model of just like stabilizing boats, uh, passing out life jackets, um, which is like, which is hard, especially for these iron boats. It's like really difficult to approach them. If you approach them from the side, you run the risk of like people just shifting, not even in a panic, but just like trying to like see what's up and like the boat potentially rolling, potentially sinking. Uh, so, you know, like being rib driver is a lot like when you're borrowing your friend's truck and trying to back out of the driveway the first time and everyone's watching you as you get on the clutch of the very, and you're like, yeah, I know what I'm doing, I swear, but things are a little hard right now to like reverse up a hill or something. So, um, but in the general scheme, it was like almost the easiest job because all I would do is like sit for hours and hours, like in this little boat, just driving back and forth and back and forth between iron boats and, uh, and mud ear. Um, and just trying to like make it as gentle and smooth as possible. Um, so it's like stabilizing the flag. It's like once like people, people get water and life jackets, like it might, people might be like alarmed at first what's going on. Eventually like people chill out. Um, feels like so comforting. I imagine like, just, I mean, I do know that like being with anyone else at sea is like an enormous comfort, even if you're like got it, you know, just having someone else around you and like, especially being from a boat with almost no communications to be like, we have all these like fancy like radios, and, like satellite systems and, and everything and like us to be in touch and like, uh, all we can do right now is sort of like hang out with you is like, uh, it, it doesn't sound like much. It definitely sounds like a lot like, oh, sorry, the world's on fire. Here's a water bottle kind of thing. But, uh, like it is like a, a surprisingly effective way to like get people to shore safely. Um, what language are you speaking? Often... French is the most useful language with these migrants that are coming out of Tunisia because they're all from like you know Central and Western African countries and really any skill set and I'll kind of pitch this at the end if you have any skills you're interested like having like French was like our most needed skill we had like one person who was also our doctor so he was already busy it's like the only good French speaker and like it, yeah it was hard and the people that's coming from like Libya are more like Arabic speakers but like yeah lots lots of French speakers um Everyone, and then on the boat, everyone's German, but the like language on our boat is like the working language is in English. But occasionally, in stressful situations, people would break out in side groups in German. But then they would see me, and they would like be like overcome with this very like German like complex sense of guilt. And over and over, the the funniest part of the whole my whole experience was no matter who was, everyone had the same line. They would look at me and go, "I'm sorry for speaking German." <laughs> Just like the same line delivered in like the same deadpan. It's like, very internalized sense of guilt. Um, yeah. Sometimes we tow people. Very rarely. Towing is like dangerous. Like I'm sure you all saw the like horrific news story of um, this boat in the Eastern Mediterranean of hundreds of people dying when uh, it's widely believed that uh, Greek authorities were trying to tow this big like wooden fishing ship and by towing it capsized it. Um, an enormous amount of people died. So towing is really scary. Sometimes in calm conditions it was like we're just trying to get people over some imaginary line so that there can be in the Italian Tsar. We would uh, tow people short distances. Um, let me check out something. I miss something? Yeah. Uh, I didn't. I did. My favorite thing to do. My favorite way of interacting with like people like a native is when they just like they're just like out of gas sometimes, and it's like this really cool thing where we can be like, "Yo, like we've got gas," or sometimes there'd be something wrong with their outboard, and like we have starting fluid, and and. Sometimes it was as simple as just like helping people restart their engine or like having extra gas. And often we're like pulling off, pulling gas off of boats that are evacuated. So we have all this like, like two stroke premixed fuel lying around. And it's like really cool to be like, here you go. There's like 20 gallons of gas. Like, let's go. And then you're kind of just like buddy boating with them and like, all right, we'll like kind of escort you or, you know, just ride with you towards Lampedusa. And that was definitely, like, my favorite, like, way of, like, interaction, where it, like, kind of felt on the most, like, even playing field. It's, like, these people out here, you know, different circumstances, but, like, they had a boat, on a boat, or, like, just out here boat. You know, it's, like, cool. And, and people's, like, spirits would really pick up once you're, like, in motion again. It's, like, this feeling of, like, of just, like, the comfort of, like, going somewhere rather than going nowhere uh, that I thought was cool and powerful and it's like, a sailor I'm really into. So we barely tow, but then like the big one is like taking people on board. I had just explained to like a German, like the only reason you would have ever heard of Chapel Hill is from like college sports. And then like later that day, we like meet someone in like a UNC shirt. <laughs> um, so, and then the, this is what NGOs are known for. Like if it, 
if we make the call that it's like, yo, this boat is just like way too dangerous. Uh, it's like way too like um, in danger of sinking, whether it's conditions or overloaded. We make the call to be like, we have to evacuate these people. Nadir, for some reason, was like magically exempt from these like new European laws about you have to go really far away. I think it's because it's like a sailboat. And it's not just that it's only registered as a pleasure craft. A lot of these boats, it's like kind of cool because they can just be registered as a pleasure craft, not like whatever else. Um, but like because it was a sailboat, they're like, oh, sailboats can go to Lampedusa. It's just like this really weird distinction. It's almost the same size as Marigo. But it's like vastly like good for us and what we'd end up doing to be able to just like um, pick up people and go to Lampedusa. Sometimes... If it was crazy, like we'd already have a bunch of people on boat on Nadir. And by a bunch, I mean like 100 people on a 60 foot boat, which is it's insane. We'd be like, okay, we cannot take another boatload of people, but if we take 10 people off this boat, it's like much less likely to just like get brushed by a wave and like all of a sudden sink or something. So it was an effective tool, but it also really like bind us down. It's like, well, then we have this connection with this other boat that's partially evacuated because, like, some of their people are, like, with us, so we can't, like, leave, and we're not going to, like, leave this other boat. And, and uh, you know, there's all sorts of, like, challenges, like, uh, we're, like, always, like, terrified of, like, splitting up families, and we, like, make our effort of, like, okay, if we're doing a partial evacuation, it's sort of, like, the thing, but, are, like, women and children are first, and, I'm, like, some people have, like, babies, you know? And... And then it was like, also, okay, if you're, like, the father and you're here, we'll, like, take you to now. But then it's, like, what well, then it's, like, someone's, like, yeah, but my, like, wife's on the boat. But just needless to say, it would be, like, very difficult. Because uh, then it's, like, we kind of, like, lose our ability to be, like, an autonomous actor. And we can, like, move around. and Because we're, like, sort of, like, bound to these other partially evacuated boats. Which would happen on our most stressful days. Uh, this is kind of like the what passed as like a hospital, like medical center. There's one of these, I don't know what medical is, it's one of those like, I don't know, oxygen or whatever, doodads and stuff like that. Uh, and when we get like really crowded, I think our record we had like 140 people on it here once, like this whole salon, would be, like totally packed full of people, it'd be people all over the deck. But yeah, once we'd start, it'd be like, all right, well, that's what we're doing, we're evacuating all these people like six by six off of these iron boats onto our boat. Things would be like so overwhelmingly crowded. You could like barely see. Um, um, this is like impossible to like get uh, things like out of hatches. Um, there was kind of like a like a a mutiny among us and our like old Italian skipper dude that I can like talk about, but like related to being like this boat is about to be like so crowded, we're not going to have any room to inflate another life raft. We need it. But I'm not there. Um, so yeah, taking people on board is kind of what NGOs are known for, and it's like kind of a cool thing that like uh, that uh, um, you know southern border migrant solidarity people like can't do. Like it's like you know that's where you catch charges if if you are like we can like move you, we can like you know as like a reformed Google. There's like I make light of this, but uh, you know in some ways it's like I would like. There'd be too, too much big picture questions in the background. I'm like, what am I actually doing here? And like, getting a ride when you really need a ride, like I'm just trying to get somewhere. It can not only be like enormously relieving, but it can be like life changing. You can remember for like years afterwards, like I was so, f-ed. I'm so glad I made it out of that town like, alive. Um, it's like a, it's like a thing to like not make light of, and just like, just like being able to like help people and move them around. It was like a really cool and powerful thing to be able to do. Uh, and sometimes it's like a weird situation where like we would get people on board and then sail a while and then Charlie Papa would eventually come meet us and like disembark from us. And people are often asking me like, is there like swell in the med? Is it like, what is like weather like? And it was sometimes like very calm, especially with this high pressure that has to do with like how hot it was. The weather was very calm, but like even in like calm conditions, like can be like really like crazy like here's the video i was trying to like uh play this is just like in like as calm as it gets um conditions of trying to disembark people from nadir onto a charlie papa boat um and it's just like you know hard um dangerous um and so this is like as easy as it possibly gets 
when you do hear about uh, sudden numbers of people dying, it's usually because there's a high pressure and the weather's calm and then the weather deteriorates and people are like still out at sea when they, you know, their motor's broken down, whatever, and the weather changes and then people die. I was fortunate enough not to encounter uh, death um, when I was there. Everyone that I was around that has been in the search and rescue scene for a longer period of time, everyone has seen death. It's, it's like, it's everywhere. Um, so yeah. Wait, uh, there was stuff on that boat? Do people, is that there's people's stuff? Uh, they have stuff with them? Like, they, yeah, surprisingly little. Like, amazingly little. Sometimes people would have, like, a purse. But no, it was shocking that people would, like, leave with, you, you know, just, like, just the clothes that they're wearing, and then sometimes still leave, like, their hoodie behind. Or, like, their shoes behind. <laughs> it's, like, shocking, like, how all in people are to just, like, making it somewhere. Like, I once found someone's, like, cell phone just going through, the, like, the trash on deck afterwards. It's just like, we have to get this back to the bus because it's, like, someone's, like, only link to, like, the entire world. This is, like, this phone that fell out of their pocket. Um, so, yeah, almost nothing. Almost nothing. All the time. Um, which is, like, I don't know if it's, like, a thing of, like, how, like, smugglers are, like, we're going to put you in this boat. You can't bring anything. It's kind of what I suspect because, like, people aren't dumb. They, they know they're going to need water, you know, and they know they're going to want stuff. But, like, I can only explain, the, like, how everyone, no one ever has water is, like, kind of like uh must be kind of from like these like coyote type smugglers that are like you're gonna pay me and you're, i'm gonna you're gonna do what i tell you i'm gonna put you in this boat don't bring anything don't worry someone will pick you up soon uh do you know how much they're paid i've heard between one and two thousand euro a head which is insane like it's just to be in like a death trap boat and, and you're kind of like where how the hell do people like have this money and I, I can only guess that it's like people's relatives like pooling everything together for something they don't really understand and like they don't see how dangerous it can be for their like teenage relative uh, but yeah like huge sums of money flying around so like a boat of 50 people that's like 100 grand potentially um, so the, the people in the game are making like insane amounts of money so what disembarkation looks like you roll up there's like ambulances and cops everywhere like i said we're like always oh, everything's at night it makes everything way more stressful everyone's like tired no one's slept neither us nor them um we like do things like try to make like food not bombs mush for people because it's like this is probably the only meal you're gonna eat in the next like 36 hours but you know it was, it was never enough so in compared to mario go this is kind of what our time on a dear be like lampedusa being like the little spot in the middle of all this and and we were not near as like really about kind of like playing it like nice and like non-confrontational and like not burning bridges with authorities just because the importance of being able to make uh, just going back and forth between Lampedusa was so essential for just bringing people to safety that uh, that it was like it was like extremely non-confrontational um, and you know it's like there are wider questions here like do we really want to just be like assimilated into like state run life saving services or are we like our own thing but this is kind of like what our trips is like a million like back and forths and then like sometimes like way down into like Libyan um search risk areas is that the whole period is that how long are you on there a month uh no this was like two weeks that's two weeks yeah um and then like before and after that getting the boat ready and then like cleaning up things afterwards and it's like the amount of time at sea is like shockingly limited like there's a, a big port in Buriana in Spain that lots of NGOs like historically have been based out of and their trip is like days of sailing to get into uh, this area to spend like a day or two at sea in operations and then turn around and have to head back and that's why there's like, kind of so many ships in the game because like you know it's like so how long are you out there is a question I often get but it's like the actual like time at sea is like a small part of all of it even for Nadir, that's like that's their whole game. It's like we can stay out there because we can just like get Coast Guard to come take people. It's like still like hard. Um, yeah, another disembarkation from Nadir. Uh, this is kind of just like there's like you know transportation like waiting everyone. A Lampedusa, it's kind of like the police presence wasn't very strong because so it's like it's like this tiny island like the like the Frontex presence was like very minimal because it's kind of like people are moved to whether they like it or not this like the one camp this overcrowded hotspot that was built for like two three hundred people and now 
hosts like 2,000 people. It's like sort of open air. There's like nowhere else for people to go. So, you know, for better or worse, there's like very little like direct, like, uh, it's not like being like when we brought people to Sicily where they like very guardedly only move five migrants at a time with like a fa- like cordon of police around them into awaiting like what seemed more like taking people to jail. Um, my time on Nadir was like really influenced with this complicated relationship with Tunisian fishermen who to cut right to the chase are the most involved in like the human trafficking game they're like they're like the actors that are like a part of it that are like making huge amounts of money off of it and i i was like constantly like torn between like are they like an ally in just the sense that like their style of smuggling is maybe like a safer method in that like they're usually at least like their game has evolved a lot uh nowadays it's often just like towing boats out into the ocean putting people in them and casting them adrift. Oftentimes, like, with no engine. It usually used to be everyone, like, leaves from Sfax with a little outboard, and they try to make it, and it's sort of, like, what you imagine. But it's like, oh, why do that when you just, like, tow a bunch of you out there, set you adrift, and then give the authorities some story, like, people would tell us, like, like, oh, we were trying to clean the engine and it fell overboard. And it's like, we're not the cops, but I know that you don't know that. And... But innately, it's kind of, like, offensive. Like, I can't believe you're putting these people in, like, like a like a little, like, a dumpster, you know? This, like, <laughs> little steel thing. Just, like, and telling them, like, don't worry, someone will come for you eventually. They always do. Like, unless the weather suddenly deteriorates or something. But, like, by the numbers, it's, like, maybe safer than people leaving under their own power from SPAC. So, you know, it's, like, this very, like, nuanced question and relationship. But they, like really pissed me off this one day when I was like so kind of like fried from the heat where I'm like started to be like iron boats are the problem we evacuate iron boats they're bad I want to empty them all take the people there get rid of the iron boats and I started just like sinking empty iron boats with a pickaxe just to be like I don't know it seemed fun or something like sink boats and then uh, usually it was boats with no outboard but, like, historically, I think they, they first were, like, attracted to this whole, like, migrant thing because they would just, like, their game was, like, the most noble thing they can do is call in a position of people in distress. Be like, oh, we'll just stay with them and wait and watch. And then once they're evacuated, they're like, oh, you don't need this outboard anymore. And, like, you're going to make way more money with, like, a plucking a 40-horse Enduro off the back of this boat. It doesn't need it anymore. Then you are going to day of fishing, you know. That's, like, a $10,000 outboard. And so that's, like, totally chill. Yeah, sure. But, um... But then I think they, like, cozied more and more and, like, well, like, since we're involved in this, we can do, like, more and more, like, nefarious practices. And the one that really pissed me off is, like, after we had evacuated this boat, this Tunisian boat, like, had people in it. And they kind of thought they were sort of, like, not being watched anymore. And they just, like, refilled it with more people that they had on their boat. You know, I'm, like, I'm not a cop. I'm not trying to stop people from, like, uh... Uh, you know, getting to Europe, but just the fact that it was like, oh, this like little boat, they can handle you. And it's like, no, we're like a little sailboat. Like we don't have any capacity, like do something else with these people. It was like really infuriated me. And I started like seeing them as like the enemy or something, which like looking back at it, like I really think was the heat getting to me. So I'd be like, I'm going to sink every boat, even the boats with their outboards. And I had this like crazy situation where uh, I like watched this boat go down while these people were like trying to recover. It was probably originally their outboard. And, like, I've never seen a boat sink before, but it was, like, almost, like, a life-changing experience. Just, like, the drama of it and, like, the huge plume of debris. And, like, uh, it had vibes of, like, like the villain at the end of the movie. It's like, no, my Lamborghini is burning all over it, you know? And it's like, yeah. After that, after, I kind of was like, I don't know. I don't really want to make, like, enemies with the Tunisian fishermen. Uh, I'm going to regret sinking their outboard, but, like, I don't know. I don't really don't know. <laughs> all I know is I sunk it. Um, uh, all right, so that's kind of my like, what happened, and uh, then it, then it was like midnight last night, and this is the part of the presentation that I like wanted to get to, but it's like oh, all I had done was like throw a bunch of questions up on this slide, um, like um, this is like talking points. I'm getting a Q and A or something soon, like. Uh, you know, there's kind of this, like, magical thinking of, like, all these things we do. Like, this isn't charity. This is, like, 
mutual aid or something, but it's like, okay, that's a nice thing to say, but like, in what extent is it? Is it really? I mean, that's not to say it's not. And like, where's like, like the, the political aspect of this? Strangely, like the most conflictual we, relationship we have to like a state entity or a, a kind of like parastate entity is the relationship with this, the Libyan Coast Guard, which are paramilitary organizations that are. Um, like an open secret being paid per head by Italian authorities to pull people back to Tunisia. Uh, oftentimes in like brutal, like in like traumatizing ways. Um, and NGOs are the only one willing to kind of like do battle with, uh, with Libyan Coast Guard, so to speak, to like get to people in time to like actually get them out of like the claws of like uh, these like um, people on like random boats with guns trying to like capture people. Um, this is like not something the Italian Coast Guard will do, and um, uh, like it is dangerous. Like when I was at sea, like another NGO was like getting shot at by a, a Libyan Coast Guard boat. Um, but it kind of like opens this question of like the Libyan Coast Guard is like the border enforcement proxy in this situation. Like how like in a similar relationship to how like the U.S. uses Mexico or the Bahamas to to outsource their border violence, and it's like. What would like outs- what would fighting outsourced border violence like look like conceptually in North America? It's like I don't know. It seems like I don't know. Hard to imagine, but like cool. I don't know. Um, uh, okay, I was just like making up to talk about like we're anarchists. Like, how do we organize ourselves on boats? Um, like I said, like some people like thought it was really cool. It's like wow. Now at a certain point, uh, uh, Chikamara Lampedusa, the like. Uh, kind of like radio control for search and rescue was like just eventually so overwhelmed in my experience so overwhelmed like they had never been they were assigning us distress cases which is like a very weird kind of reversal of a relationship uh, that they're like we don't have resources to get to these people will you like go to this case um, and some people like kind of were like into it that was like yeah this is a cool like wow we're kind of like un- like deputized almost by the Italian Coast Guard and like NGOs are stepping into this with like our politics and our views and it's like we're more in power and uh, and this is kind of like a question I see like uh, especially in like um, the American context of like this could be like taking you could see this like taking jurisdiction away from um, from from like the police especially situation like responding to mental health crises you know we have this whole discussion of like what if there were like other organizations that could like respond instead of the police with this like prevent deaths and killings and it's like, is that a fight for like taking away their power, or is that just kind of being absorbed by them, and and like we find ourselves doing their dirty work or something? Um, and then you know, it's just like, uh, it's sort of my overall experience was I came into the search and rescue scene as you know, like a anti-borders, like crazy anarchist or something, and I and my outsider perspective was like. Isn't it cool that these, like, Antifa anarchists are kind of, like, steering these, like, humanitarian uh, European liberals into doing this cool, like, uh, anti-borders activism, like, lessening the, like, the impact and restrictions to freedom that, like, borders have on people. It's, like, lessening their bite. Uh, And it's like, wow, we're, like, really running the show. And then I kind of got there, and I almost had, like, a sudden, like, reversal of a feeling. It's like, oh oh wow, it's like actually very real and a, an enormous amount of people are just dying in, in the Mediterranean all the time and uh, I kind of more felt like I was the fool like oh yeah you're like political or whatever like why don't you get like a water bottle and a life jacket and like once people and just like think about human lives first um, and then maybe a third stage, which was even more unsettling after I was there for a while, the, like the scope of everything started to sink in. And it's like, yeah, we can just be focused on like step one of just save lives. That's all we do. But when we just view what we do, it's just like these numbers of like how many life jackets can we pass out? Like, do we lose our like political ground? Uh, and I, I don't have answers to those questions, but... The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. The Anarchist Radio Berlin. From across the pond. So it's the Anarchist Radio Berlin. With audios in English, Spanish, and German. And please, 
don't mention the war. You can find us at channelzeronetwork.com and aradio-berlin.org. If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay, or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf slash support. Hi, it's Coyle in the present again with updates. So the enormous boom in migrant departures out of Tunisia that I experienced and was talking about has slowed greatly, almost completely stopping at one point. Friends still in the scene tell me they think that this is probably because Europe has entered backroom negotiations with the Tunisian government and used their political leverage to uh, get Tunisia to enforce their border policies by proxy in much the same kind of relationship that they have with powers in Libya and Maybe this kind of forecasts how Europe plans to enforce its borders going into the future. Uh, migrants are still fleeing out of Libya, as they have for many years, even though uh, they've long been the target of political violence from within Libya. And so I suspect that people will probably still continue fleeing, departing out of both of these countries uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, crackdown or no crackdown. So, in many ways, this summer is still uh, a lot like last summer, and the same anti-fascist orgs, same ships, are still out there doing the same kind of aid and rescues at sea right now. Uh, one change that does seem significant to me is a new Italian law that prohibits or restricts search and rescue orgs with airplanes from using airfields near migrant corridors. This seems really significant to me because planes were super useful in my time there. And it does seem like not having them around is a blow to being able to find and help people at sea. In a broader scope, as just like an anarchist and sailor and an outsider, I went into last summer wondering if there were greater potentials to this huge scene of all these ships and radicals with maritime credentials like could they retool or respond to other needs or revolutionary moments and one small way that has kind of really uh, struck me as sort of like a profound yes is how some of the uh, orgs doing uh, search and rescue have since pivoted towards gaza like one ship that I sort of crossed paths with open arms delivered aid directly to Gaza uh, using this big barge. Um, and that was only days after Biden announced like the ill fated ill uh, fated uh, U.S. temporary aid pier that kind of flopped. Uh, I don't know if open arms did that more than once or if it was like kind of a stunt, but it is like still cool. And similarly, uh, right now, um, there is another uh, aid ship um, that's like explicitly an aid ship for Palestine out of Norway called Handala uh, that is currently underway for Palestine. And I can't say for sure, but uh, it seems to me like it was probably birthed out of like the same people and the same scene that have experienced doing search and rescue in the Mediterranean. So I think that's significant and cool. Thanks for listening. And if you ever find yourself in Buriana or Sicily and you like ships uh, or just welding and grinding or whatever, you should try to help out. Thanks. I do. You talked about Italy. <clears throat> Have you said what's going on the coast of France? No. Do you know? Uh, 
my short answer is no. Uh, I, I was like, so had the blinders on in like day to day life in search and rescue in this one particular area. Um, I know there are other migrant corridors, um, but in my understanding, this is currently like the busiest and craziest one of all. Um, I'm like a vaguely like lots of NGOs used to operate in Eastern Mediterranean, like uh, to like uh, Lesbos and Greece. And my general understanding is like fascists have. Uh, amass such power that it's like impossible to operate an NGO life saving ship there. It's just like there are so many like laws and restrictions against it. It, it really is like impossible. Um, it's just like sad to say, but it's like most sort of uh, our efforts now are focused on the these two particular areas. Um, I, um, maybe I might have missed the very beginning of here, but uh, is it ever the goal or? Uh, do people ever simply make it and get off the boat and just make it into the country without contacting the authorities? No, but there are, I forgot to point out, I have a slide that illustrates this. I was like, despite all this, and I talk about like Coast Guard, this, there are autonomous arrivals. Like still, people do make it all the way to Lampedusa under their own power and their own control and their own autonomy. And uh, I mean, it's kind of a scene like, you're never going to make it in unnoticed. It's just like such, there's just so many actors out there that it, there's like this huge, you can almost like, if you're hanging out, we'd like hang out by, there's a place to get ice cream sometimes to try to avoid. And you'd almost like hear the shouting of like migrant boats just like showing up, not entirely unexpectedly, but not like totally expected. Like usually there's like one cop boat trailing them by now. Um, but there are stories of, of migrant boats just like landing on the tourist beach in Lampedusa. And just be like, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's like, there's not a lot of that because it's like a tiny island, so there's no really to like to like hide if you're trying to avoid getting steered into like the machinery of like migrant processing. Um, but uh, yeah, people are are kind of just like we're just going straight there. It, it does happen. Um, maybe a little bit more of a personal question. The last three steps that you mentioned that I thought were really important. Um, I'm really telling not just through your story, but also sort of more generally, I think for all of us, the steps of being politically informed, but maybe kind of tying into the actual experience of it, being sort of overwhelmed by the experience of it, and just being wrapped up in um, trying to do as much good as you can in that moment. And then the third step of being overwhelmed by that um, need and then moving back towards the politics. How do you think that that process how do you think that you, on that third step, um, have changed emotionally from that first time? Because you sort of have a similar aim in those two, right? And you're like, oh, actually, we need to change the politics of all this. But I feel like that process would change you sort of your emotional tenor towards it. Does that make sense as a question? It's kind of cool. I usually just try to avoid having to answer the question directly and distract myself with like, uh, I'm here because I like boats, and if I'm going to do boat <laughs> shit, I might as well do boat shit like this or whatever. Yeah. And I, I, sorry, I'm kind of like fried and like trying to follow your question, but yeah. like, but it, things may be more specifically like, well, the answer is to like look for our niche. Like, like, like I was saying, there's like fewer boats in like the weird stretch of sea between like Tunisia and Lampedusa, but it would be like, we can only do so much. Let's try to find people that are like less likely to be like immediately helped. Um, is that, is that any kind of like, yeah, no, I mean, that's sort of, I think, aiming towards it, right? And like, yeah, this idea, of, okay, okay, the, the bigger political question is still overwhelming, but finding a um, yeah. But also, I guess, I mean, like, I, you know, this is probably something that's unanswerable in a single, you know, session like this, but, like, how did you emotionally change in your uh, relationship to the migrant crisis I see between before and after? You know, I really am embarrassed to say that, like, after a while, I kind of, like, got, like, just in my tiny short period of time, like, like, almost like a like frustrated with like connecting to people is like uh, and I kind of viewed it as like I'm I'm have this role to play and 
And like I would, uh, in situations like I alluded to, and we would be like, how long have you been here? And it was very obvious that they had just been like offloaded by like a Tunisian like fisherman. I uh, would, uh, they'd like give some answer that we like found like very hard to believe. And it's like, almost surely because they thought we were cops and they were like, okay, you have to tell them this one thing or else they like won't help you, which wasn't true, but and I'd be like, damn, it's like sucks these people like lie to us or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it, it's like... That frustration's real. Yeah. yeah, but no, I would like find myself kind of going down this thing and like becoming like less like emotionally like invested in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes just like when people were like on the boat and I, I'd be like just really trying to get out another like like raft or something and be like can we get more water and I'd be like I just passed out water and I realized it was like two bottles like an hour ago or something <laughs> I mean that's just the other feel yeah, yeah. but I would just like find myself like kind of losing like patience and just like especially the constant cycling of people and then like I really had to take a step back to be like that's like not why I'm here I'm not trying to be like fucking Charlie Papa just like these are faceless people I'm trying to move through I should spend more time trying to like engage with them or which I'm like not a very bad at making conversation to begin with so it's like extra hard to be like so sub with tigre or whatever <laughs> but uh yeah it's hard and I kind of think that's why like these like these like things that run the NGOs are like we're going to make two week, week rotations because scientifically people kind of get burned out at the end of two weeks and I, I'm kind of just like they know that and I'm like cycled through like that which I, if that is the case that is true uh, thank you that's that was- um, I could think of answers to this question, but why do you think no one like us has tried to do a non-for-profit, full operation smuggling situation? I can think of answers to why, but if... Um, like why NGOs don't instead try to operate on the Tunisian side, like Tunisian fishermen? That are like doing this, but like if it's uh, too illegal for an NGO, then like why aren't like I don't know. Oh yeah, just, yeah. that's a great question. Uh, um, I haven't really considered it. Uh, one is because like the role is kind of like filled. There's like a lot of like these Tunisian people doing that, and like yes, we could probably do it to assure like some degree of increased safety, but I don't think it would be really that different. Right. Um. And the logistics of, like, being these, like, you know, like, Europeans, like, operating, like, in Tunisia. Like, there's the stories of, like, NGOs just trying to, like, just land in Tunisia for, for like, emergency reasons, for, like, their own personal reasons, and, like, having very difficult times being there. Um, like, the ocean is where, like, the bureaucracy that controls the world is at its unseen peak. There is no corner of human existence that is more subjugated to, to these kinds of elements of control than ships at sea. It's like where bureaucracy thrives. And it's like really hard to do this, even even for like, there's this debate of like having boats, having like honest and proper German flags, like registered in Germany, whereas like, or having ports of convenience. Like there's some NGOs like, ah, we're just going to get a Brazilian registration. That's actually like a huge problem, despite usually hear about like, oh, that's easier. It's like just really hard for, for reasons to like be at sea and not be legit, which is like kind of like, in like a weird way, I was like very relieved to find this uh, form of like, a, I don't know, solidarity, whatever, anarchy shit that wasn't just like clandestine attacks at night. And it's kind of like, part of it is like I show a cop my passport, you know? And I'm like, there's nothing I'm like trying to hide here, but I still feel like I'm doing something that is like conflictual. And, uh, I could imagine things like that, but it'd just be like really hard to just. Yeah. So when people make it into Italian border patrol custody, they're automatically guaranteed like refugee status or we, asylum or something. Okay, I'm surely going to talk out of my uh, field of understanding, but sure answer is like kind of no. A lot of people do get deported. We kind of give them like a, uh, like a, uh, I forget what you called it, like legal, whatever, like rundown in whatever language we can communicate with them and be like, all right, 
Don't say you're here for like family reunion. You have to say you're here for like protection or you're a refugee. Uh, we like give them like the best like legal basis they have of like not being immediately like, turned away from um, European border enforcement. Which again, yeah, it's bizarre. Like everyone kind of makes it, and it's like this wall behind the borders, like the bureaucratic one that really uh, seems to be like the bigger obstacle. Uh, and then like people just trying like Italy's not their ultimate destination. They're trying to like make it in Northern Europe or like wherever else, and like. There's like so many other hurdles. It's kind of like this defense in depth that, that Fortress Europe does. So I think the short answer is no. Uh, and like I mentioned, I mean, basically I don't know. Yeah. Do you know if people are mostly like kept in detention and then deported or like given court dates and the way, because in the US the way it happens is a lot of people are like integrated into the system and then given court dates and stuff like that and then just like then become undocumented. But do you know if it's, it's it's like that, where people are kept in detention and then deported. From what I understand, people are in detention in Lampedusa. Mm-hmm. And then there's like very little processing that happens, except supposedly when they try to pin smuggling charges on people because they were like driving the boat. Mm-hmm. It's like absurd. Supposedly they will stay in Lampedusa, which is relevant because there is an organization called Maldusa, which from my experience, I didn't explicitly be like, so y'all like anarchists? Like, what's up? But I kind of got like anarchy vibe from them. That, and that's like one of the things they do try to offer like assistance with. There's like this captain support program or whatever to try to like uh, offer legal support. So that's like kind of the first step of like, like it's not really significant by the numbers. And then everyone gets moved to like a larger camp in Sicily. And then from there kind of distributed to other camps in the rest of Italy. And I think that's where they like go through like applying for refugee status. Whoa. So, so they are kind of kept detained. Yes. Uh, that's my understanding. I'm curious about this event. It came in perhaps when you were talking about it at first. Um, but I didn't talk about this with like, the use of your photography, or like you did like just into other people's faces and like, yeah, like how to perhaps like identifiable information. And then I think about like the ways that like cameras that have been like exploited in the past, like used for exploitation, um, and sort of like, was like any of the things that, like orgs you worked with, or like specific people that y'all worked with, like was it addressed like within the framework that like the role that y'all occupy as like being the people that are taking people off of ships and not the ones that are on the ships, like even though you're both in boats, like that the inherent hierarchy and that, like, how to address that and how not to continue to perpetuate it? Was that part of the conversation being out there? Like, like how we can, um, shield them from legal indemnity? Like, to start, like, how we can offer them for, or, or, or if we should be doing more to, like... No, like, it's always just, like, socially and, like, in your... Like, ex- <laughs> like with the last talk, like in your imagination, in your head, like the way that you are like showing up in your work, like in some ways, like the like the ethical drive behind, like why you're there and like the actions that you're doing, uh, like it may perhaps part of like if you work with NGOs, like in the mission statement, or like if you got trained before going out, like in the trainings, or even just like within conversations in your in your crew. I'm curious, like was that part of the framework of your actions, like we're out here saving people. Also, how are we? Are, are we actively trying to like break down hierarchy? Are we actively trying to like be? I, I, yeah, like was that part? Of yeah, I think I'd like to think the short answer is yes. Um, like like I was saying, we would like try as best we can to give people like the most accurate information of like uh, their um, uh, of of uh, how to avoid like legal trouble and like how to get refugee status and how to avoid being like pulled out as like a smugglers or something. I kind of think that this us as like a middle agent um, taking people aboard and then giving uh, people to uh, Charlie Popper to Lampedusa almost maybe shields them in like some way of like of I imagine it'd be like much harder to like pin out individuals than like when police like approach um, migrants at, at sea to begin with. Um, but yeah, it, it was definitely something that like we would like, talk about amongst us, and we'll, like we were worried about. Although sometimes it would backfire. Like we would like explain the emphasis of like 
yo, they try to take, there's like drones, they try to take photographs of people um, who are like operating the boat. Everyone know that like they might tell you like you won't get refugee status unless you point out who was driving, but it's a lie. Your refugee status will not be affected if you just say you didn't notice who was driving. Uh, these are like kind of the things we try to like explain to people. Um, and uh, but sometimes it would backfire. Like once there was a situation at night where like we I think we scared people so bad that Charlie Papa was there to just like really just evacuate them, and they're so busy I can't imagine them trying to press like charges against like. Uh, you know, whoever's driving this boat, which let's be clear is like a, a very small numbers when it happens. But they were like so scared that no one would even go back to the outboard to like to cut the engine or shift into neutral. You know, so they just like idle and like no one's at the helm and it's just moving and like they're like, what the fuck? Well, like someone like stopped this boat and they're like trying to toss lines. And it's actually like, oh, okay, I'm sure no one's gonna get charged if you literally just like do this to the outboard. So it, it was hard. Uh, I mean, um, like I was saying, uh, um, Maldusa, who's like actually kind of has to, tries to have more of like a presence in Lampedusa rather than us NGOs that are just like in and out and like no one really has like a base there. They're more like an Italian organization and, and they do try to uh, help people with like legal persecution and like somehow connect people to resources. I, I don't really know what all they do, but I do think that's, it's something that we want to do but can't just because of like our limitations, but like other orgs that are like actually in the med, and there like should be a lot more of those, in my opinion. But did people do like sensitivity trainings or interpersonal? That's like kind of what you're asking. Yeah, because like I just like the people that I was talking to, they were like, "Oh, you know, like I'm a refugee, so I don't have to like worry about like like, like, I wonder how you don't fall into a white savior complex, and, like, if that is baked into, like, what you're doing, even though it's, like, not part of necessarily like, the legal part, like, it's, it's, yeah, it's not legality, it's, like, in your brain, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for my admittedly limited experience, there are some NGOs that, like, really run the white savior thing. That they, like, really exist on, like, you know, their, like, media presence, and that, like, really sells to, like, German liberals for German reasons, and there are for sure some boats that, like, pander to that, which I find, personally, like, really repulsive. Um, the, the very limited amounts of people I were with, we would, like, we would talk about, like, uh, of, like, I don't know, uh, of, like, as far as, I, 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 mean, I had no hand myself in, like, media and all that. I was actually like, taken care of by invisible, like, land crew. But, um, uh, yeah, like I say, it's something that we all, like, want to avoid, and how to avoid it is, like, a different question. I, I don't have a good answer. Uh, but, I mean, like, obviously it's, like, a super relevant question. And, uh, uh, I mean, you're not taking photos, like, all the photos you showed, you're not, like, the white missionary in the photo smiling with them, like using them as trophies. Like you're not like, uh, was there like a sensitivity training where you're, they were like, don't take photos with people, like, you know, or whatever. And and you, at the beginning you were talking about like how you like did your best to like get consent when you took photos and shit. So yeah, something there. Yeah, we had this one day where like there was this photographer that's like, can I go out on like a trip with y'all? And uh, we kind of thought like he came from like activist background and like. Uh, we uh, were like assumed he would kind of like play it chill but totally was like in people's faces with like a t telephoto lens like Nat Geo style and I'm like I'm done with that guy I don't know where any of his photos ended up I'm like you know I was like I was bummed at it personally I don't know like it was a mistake uh, but um, yeah I mean I didn't take a single photograph personally myself so it's kind of more of me like judging the scene I know you mentioned a lot of like Germans, um, particularly that you worked with, but what were some of like the requirements for somebody even to um, like volunteer like you did and like visa wise or nationality wise? Like what were the demographics of people that you were working with and and like with borders and between borders and you know, did people 
stay for long periods of time there? Are they mostly European and they don't have visa issues? Um, yeah. As far as people like working in like the search and rescue yeah. bubble? Yeah. Um, having a passport is like, uh, I don't know, any NGO out there that's trying to like avoid like like kind of those fundamental like border regulations of, of doing that illegally. So is there kind of, although strangely, I checked out of Malta out of the EU and I never checked back in, even though we were in Lampedusa a bunch. So kind of the whole time I was on, uh, uh, Nadir, I was like not in the EU <laughs> like mm-hmm. officially. Um, it was just like funny looking back on it. That, like I was like, you know, with some like not, I was not stamped in or anything you want to say. Um, just historically, there's been like this heavy German presence just because it's kind of where it like came from culturally, but like more and more there's like other like uh, European nationalities, especially like there's this overwhelming need for more Italian like speakers and French speakers involved. And what's cool is like the really big NGOs, like Sea Watch, uh, kind of like Sea Watch is hard to describe because also aside to this, I did do like shipyard work on a Sea Watch ship up in Germany in Flensburg, just like in the shipyard helping it get ready. And that kind of like cool thing, it's like it's like exploding so big that you know it was like Sea Watch is sort of synonymous like Antifa, but now it's like so big that it's like less subcultural, but like more like people like totally different nationalities can find their way in because it's sort of more mainstream and like I met like like there's like this Gahanian dude there and like people from Indonesia and like it's like really kind of like slowly the demographics are changing and like if I mean I don't want any of this to continue ever it's like stupid and there should be no reason for like us to be out there and just like let people have free passage and there'd be no need it's like this dumb game where at the very least like Coast Guard can get people um, but if this if NGO search and rescue continues, I do see it becoming a more like uh, kind of like multicultural thing. That's my guess. It's probably because a lot of people end up living in Germany, right? Um, in why Germany like feels like connected? Yeah. To? Or like started? Things. Maybe. I don't know. I couldn't say. Yeah. I'm going to miss this in the beginning, but I was wondering just with photos, like what kind of conversations are like in training leading up to doing these like rescues of the boat where we're just talking about like consent with photo takings and also like talking about um, the rescues, the partial rescues, like what training was put in place. Uh, yeah, um, I, were you there in the beginning when I was like talking about photo, are you just like clarifying question or like did you catch my intro or? I, I'm getting a little late, so I wasn't sure if this was talked about, but, like, is that photo taken? Yeah, I touched on in the beginning. Uh, to recap, it was, like, uh, there was, like, what... I was on two different boats, and one was kind of more, like, Antifa, like, Anarcho, like, kind of people, and kind of just, like, didn't take photos, or if they did, it was just, like, trying to, like, make effort to not have people's, like, identities and things. And the other was, like, more kind of, like, mainstream, uh, straight-laced, and... Uh, it's just like the rest of the world that's like, oh, people take pictures of people, which I, you know, it's like, I like photo consent personally. Um, but, uh, they would, but they would make just like kind of a general vague effort to be like, hey, y'all, like, is it okay if we like take photos? And um, I feel like it's very possible that like some people were like, I don't want, I don't know. No one spoke up, but it's like very likely that some people did it. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. And then my my decision to use photos, I know it's like totally arbitrary, but of the like thousand photos that I had dumped on me, I like tried to find ones that like spoke to me and my memories of like, I remember like those particular people and I kind of felt like those were like, both like portrayed in the photograph and my memories of them was like some kind of situation where we were like, both individuals, if not like entirely like equal, like uh, like uh, I tried to find photos that reflected like humanity and not just make them just like just like a uh, people in need of help and assistance, um, like uh, yeah. And I can't like, and I know this doesn't like directly answer this, but I cannot describe the like thousands of like non consensual selfies that I was in of just like every there was like a very heavy photo taking environment on all accounts. Which is like also really weird in a social media way of like everybody was sort of just like, if not live streaming, just like Instagramming like all of them and people's like arrival in like a way that 
I'd be like, I don't know. I don't know if that's like a good idea, but I'm no judgment. It's just like shocking. Um, so yeah, I was like kind of, I mean, I put this presentation together. I am responsible for like doing this public event, with these photographs. Um, uh, yeah, I totally understand that it's like, yeah. I thought it was a beautiful presentation. Thank you, Kyle. Up there. This Eventa crew is like really cool, like punks that are facing like lots of charges from like 2017 for like trying to pin like illegal uh, uh, entry into the EU or whatever on people. Um, that's kind of this big like ongoing court case like at the forefront. Of life, so. And I've got a cool like Twitter presence or whatever. So follow the Eventa crew. One. To hear the 2023 interview that we conducted with an activist with Maldusa on similar topics, you can find that by searching M-A-L-D-U-S-A. It was the June 11th, 2023 episode. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Education in prison is a swindle, a complex boondoggle of the highest order. You've got GED testing, vocational training, and now you've got the return of college classes on Pell Grants, thanks to former President Trump, who was apparently planning long-term for a future commitment of his own. <clears throat> but all of this is a scam, and unfortunate, too. Studies back in the early 90s showed repeatedly that educational attainment was the principal determinant against recidivism. That is, the more education the prisoner gets, the lower the chances of reoffending. Ironically, right after those studies, the federal government suspended Pell Grant funding for prisoners for three decades. No crime. Now Pell Grants are back, and there's a lot of money flowing into prisoner education, but very little educating. Here's how it doesn't work in Ohio. For the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, you've got two systems of swindle set up. One of them relates to GED and vocational training, and the other relates to college. When you're talking about GED and vocational, you're talking about the Ohio Central School System. The Ohio Central School System sounds like a real thing, like you expect to see brick buildings with school buses and classrooms full of kids. Well, it ain't that. The Ohio Central School System is like an offshore dummy corporation set up to launder money. In this case, the Ohio Central School System launders federal block grant funding. The U.S. Department of Education hands out cash to states for certain programs, GED, vocational training, for instance. But to qualify, you have to meet very specific terms. If you don't meet those terms, you don't qualify. And we're talking potentially millions of dollars here. So, the ODRC set up the Ohio Central School System to pull in all that federal block grant money. For each student enrolled, the federal government allots an amount of cash. So for the ODRC, butts in seats equals piles of loot. As a result, the ODRC made it mandatory for all prisoners who didn't already graduate high school to get a GED. Mandatory. There are now classrooms at every Ohio prison filled with butts in seats. I know a guy 80 years old who was told to go to GED classes or go to the hole. He asked them, if he had gotten by this long without an education, why did he need one now? But what he didn't realize was he didn't need the education. They needed him to attend the class. Cha-ching. On three different occasions, I was told by case managers that I had to enroll in GED classes. Repeatedly, it seems, they lost all records of my high school diploma, even while I was enrolled in college. I had a college degree, and they were trying to force my butt into a GED seat. One of the principal problems here is 
GED teachers know job security is based on failure. So if all prisoners attain a GED, the teachers are out of jobs. So most teachers reflect a lack of ambition. The state pulls in millions, the teachers drink coffee, the prisoners sit in classes. Vocational is an even bigger swindle. At each prison, a number of prisoners are enrolled in vocational landscaping. They mow the grass. Others are vocational plumbers or vocational electricians or vocational HVAC. These prisoners plunge toilets, replace light bulbs, clean filters in the vent system. In essence, they're slave labor on the plantation. At Mansfield, for instance, vocational masonry built the brick guard shacks on the compound. Now, the block grants require all kinds of classroom work to accompany vocational training. But Ohio prisons just fudge that. Ohio rakes in millions. Prisons get free maintenance crews. The prisoners get certificates in vocational whatever. Everybody wins, right? Well, not the prisoners. Those certificates might get them jobs when they get out, but they soon get fired when bosses realize they don't really know anything. Plunging toilets, changing light bulbs, and building a guard shack don't really translate to a marketable skill. But Ohio keeps the millions of dollars. The Federal Department of Education never really conducts an audit. So the Ohio Central School System operates as a kind of slush fund for subsidizing the costs of the prison system itself. In prison, the college swindle is a separate animal. In the 90s, under the old Bell Grants, Ashland University had the exclusive contract with the ODRC. At Mansfield alone, there were at least four classrooms with 30 seats filled for five classes a day. They even had evening classes. Not only did Ashland rake in guaranteed tuition paid by the federal government for each butt in each seat, but Ashland used the prisoners to pad their minority enrollment. In the 1990s, you'd have a hard time finding a black or brown face on the campus at Ashland. Today, Sinclair College has the contract, for now. In previous semesters, you'd find associate professors hired specifically to teach in prison at a much lower pay rate than professors on campus. And those associate professors would teach on site at one prison, while students in several other prison classrooms across the state attend via Zoom. So one half-price professor might be teaching 75 to 100 students at a time. Butts in seats equals pile of loot, guaranteed Pell Grant funding. Sinclair gets rich, prisoners get degrees, those degrees eventually get them jobs, and their lack of any real expertise gets them fired. But Sinclair keeps the money, at least for now. A competing university, Kent State, is looking to underbid Sinclair for the contract. Kent State, you may recall, is famous for killing their students in the 1970s. Because Kent State is trying to move in on Sinclair's turf, Sinclair is deliberately tanking the program. To make Pell Grant boondoggles look unprofitable, Sinclair is now refusing to enroll prisoner students, leaving seats empty on purpose, so that the financials will make Kent State think prison contract is a loser. Here at OSP, Dr. Langle the Sinclair site director is enrolling only three students and leaving five available seats empty, just to deceive competitor colleges. That means that Sinclair is violating their contract, and they're no longer providing education, but they're refusing education. And they're doing it because the college puts its own profits ahead of public safety and the common good. So when the parole board gives me five more years for not getting an education, it's because Sinclair College cared more about money than about my freedom. You can contact the provost at Sinclair, Anthony Ponder, at 937-512-2364, and you can let him know that Dr. Langle at OSP is a capitalist turd, that they need to start enrolling students again. 
And you can feel free to attach this audio to an email you send to annette.chambers-smith at odrc.state.oh.us to let the Ohio Prisons Director know that Sinclair is breaching its contract. Maybe even share this with the U.S. Department of Education and demand an audit. Who said crime doesn't pay? This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown, Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop.